But we really are having a blessed time here during this series with Pastor Frank, Frank Fourier. Now, I call him pastor, though he's, I don't think pastors a church, but he has demonstrated God's gift of pastoral ministry. And uh, he is the president of Adventist Layman's Services and Industries, which is the organization that brings all of our self-supporting institutions, supportive institutions, and those who are involved in business together uh, in presenting Christ in the marketplace. It's an exciting organization. They have a, a national uh, convention every year. This year is going to be in uh, in Florida, I think. No, it's going to be in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, this this next year. So uh, it is an exciting place. It was in Florida last year, and uh, it's sometimes hard for me to remember exactly where these things are going to take place. If you're not a member of ASI and you are involved in business are in some type of an organization, you have a doctor's office, a dentist's office, or some type of self-supporting ministry of any kind, we would love to invite you to become a part of ASI. 3ABN has been a part of ASI since our beginning, and it was at a place in 1985, I believe it was, out in uh, Montana uh, uh, when Danny Shelton was able to f talk to th uh, those at ASI and suddenly began to get support from the members of that group. And uh, as they say, the rest is history because ASI and 3ABN have been partners ever since. Well, our speaker, Frank Fourier, has had a wide range of experience. He's headed a number of uh, organizations that have reached out into the mission field. He and his wife are both, in fact, their entire family, uh, son Jason as well, are involved in mission work. And he is the president of the Eden Valley Institute, and he has been bringing this series called Get Ready, Get Ready, Get Ready. And tonight, his sermon is going to be entitled, The Loud Cry. Now, we're excited, and we're ready to listen to that. But before he comes, I'm going to invite Pastor John Lomacain to come and sing a song that was done in the Pillars 2 album. It's an old Adventist song. It's about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and I really love this. In fact, my wife Camille says this is one of her very favorites. Don't you see my Jesus coming? Don't you see my Jesus coming? Don't you see him in yonder clouds? With 10,000 angels round him, see how they my Jesus crown. I am bound for the King. Will you go to glory with me? Hallelujah, oh, praise ye the Lord. Don't you see the saints ascending? Hear them shouting through the air. Jesus, my i 
triumph bursting around them glory glory everywhere i am bound for the kingdom will you go to glory with me hallelujah oh praise ye the lord hallelujah oh praise ye the lord good evening everyone Again, it's a blessing to be here. Wonderful opportunity for me. A tremendous honor to be asked to share with you here at 3 a.m. I would like to invite you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I quoted a specific quotation earlier on today. And I would like to share that with you one more time. Third selected messages 202. It says this. Our sanctification is God's object in all his dealings with us. Jesus, God wants us to be like him. God wants us to be like Jesus. But the question we need to ask ourselves now is, what is God like? Well, I had you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And of course, this isn't going to describe all that God is like, but it is one verse that says one thing here. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're looking at verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And if you read that correctly, it is the Lord, He is one. Now the Jews and the Muslims and some anti-Trinitarians would like to take this word one and make it singular. Well, obviously in the English language it is singular. And yet we know that there is something more to this issue than what meets the eye. I'll have you turn to John chapter 10 and verse 30. John chapter 10 and verse 30. You can turn there. I'm going to read one more than one verse. John chapter 10, verse 30. We look at, at what Jesus is saying. And he says, I and my Father are one. Now obviously, or not obviously, but Jesus either doesn't know how to count or he's giving this word one a deeper meaning. We're in John chapter 10. Now usually when you and I as Christians speak about oneness, we're talking about unity, we're talking about being in agreement, we're talking about having the same purpose, the same vision, and the same goals. But Jesus here is thinking about something much deeper, and the Jews that he is within his hearing, the Jews are knowing what he is trying to say, and they don't like it. As a matter of fact, in verse 31, they pick up stones to throw at him. We're going to read that, verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So the question is why? All that he said is, I and my Father are one. Now, if you and I said, I am one with God, people would understand that we're saying we're one in unity, we're one in spirit, we're, we're going in the same direction. And I kind of doubt that in those days, if Jesus had said that, that he or anyone else had said that, that they would have said, well, he's saying that we're in unity. But they understood what he was saying here. They picked up stones. Why did they pick up stones? We're looking at verse 32 and we're looking at verse 33 in John chapter 10. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Now humanly speaking, this would be a pretty wild claim, I think, if a human being would come along and call himself God. And you have to put yourself in the shoes of the Jews. Here is Jesus. They know his father. 
They know his mother. They know his brothers. They know his sisters. He's human as far as they can tell. When he walks the dusty roads, his clothes become soiled like anybody else's. And now he is announcing that he is God. And they're having to make, uh, they're having to think this through. And as far as they is concerned, this is blasphemy. And they pick up stones to throw at him. Now we can see the same thing happen in John, in John chapter 8, looking at verse 56 to 58. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? You are not making sense here. And Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, before Abra Abraham was, I am. Now that's an amazing saying. Jesus is actually saying, I am the eternal one. I am ever present. Before Abraham was, I existed. As a matter of fact, I exist there right now. Jesus exists at all time, all the time. And they understood what he was saying. And again, of course, in verse 59, they took up stones to, th to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So what would you have thought? What would you have said being one of them? Well, friends, I don't believe that Jesus expected everyone to take him just at his word, just because he made the claim. I believe with all my heart that, that he would want them to take this claim and measure it against the fruit that he bore, against the work that he did. Um, if you turn to John chapter 14, we can see that. In John chapter 14, we're looking at verse 11, and we can see how Jesus is thinking. John chapter 14, we're looking at verse 11. Jesus speaking says, Believe me, I am in the Father, the Father is in me. Or else, believe me for the very work's sake. Believe me for the fruit that I bear. Believe me for the things that you see that I can do and the words that I say. Now, if you were there to see the works of Jesus, you would have seen some marvelous things. Jesus, of course, he performed all kinds of miracles. Uh, but miracles were something that came through through the whole, the, the whole Old New Testament. And people had performed, prophets had performed miracles. God had performed miracles through other people before. And so to them, this was not conclusive. But they should have studied his life more closely, the holiness of his life and the beauty of his life and the love that he expressed and the tenderness with which he dealt with people. His self-denial, his humility, his holiness, all of this should have been seen by these people as pointing to something more than special. Yeah. As a matter of fact, at his dying at the cross of Calvary, we, there, there was a centurion there. And you remember the centurion being a pagan Roman soldier, recognized who Jesus was. And he said, surely this is the Son of God. Well, now, friends, I would like to transfer our reasoning to ourselves. Seventh-day Adventists, do we make any claims? Do we claim to be God's chosen people? Do we claim to be God's true church? Do we claim to worship God on the right day as opposed to others? Out of whom do we say comes the remnant people? Out of whom do we say comes the 144,000? Are we really the repairers of the breach? Are we really the restorers of paths to dwell in? Are these claims true? Or are we just being arrogant? Ah, friends, listen. These claims that we make as Seventh-day Adventists would be outlandish unless we act like God's people are supposed to act, unless we love as Jesus loved, unless we sacrifice as Jesus sacrificed, unless we are self-denying as he was, unless we serve as he served. Does that make sense to you? Because it makes sense to me. But friends, we will act that way. We will do as Jesus did. If you go, we're still in John chapter 14. Look at verse 10, verse 12 here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me 
the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Every time I read this verse, I am reminded of what it means to have faith. Can you imagine having faith in this, word, in this Bible text, in this verse, in this wonderful promise? It is saying here that if we had faith in every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, we would act just like Jesus and we could do the works of Jesus and greater works than these would we do. That's what the Bible promises. Can you believe it? Do you operate that way? Have you gone forward to serve as Jesus serves? Ah, oh, friends, we need to serve as Jesus serves. We're here in this world. I believe that we quoted another verse earlier. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, that is to enlarge his kingdom, and his righteousness, that is to become just like Jesus, and all the rest shall be added unto you. I believe that we have the privilege today to live like Jesus lived, to do as Jesus did, and the claims that we make as to who we are will be ratified in our example and in our good works. Do you believe it? I believe it with all my heart. Now, what kind of works am I talking about here? Am I talking about walking on water or multiplying bread or raising the dead or calling fire down from heaven? Why, no, friends. We know that in the last days, miracles are not going to be that upon which we can base our, our, our credibility. We know that the two beasts, the two great beasts of Revelation chapter 13, deceive the whole world by the means of those miracles that they are able to do. Oh, that doesn't mean that you and I will not work miracles. As a matter of fact, the Lord works miracles on my behalf all the time. It's amazing. I wish I had time to tell you story after story of what the Lord has done for me. Ah, but miracles are not what the people are going to see and be able to determine whether this is God's true people or whether it is a false people. You know, I run a lifestyle center at Eden Valley. And we have all kinds of people coming to the Lifestyle Center. And because we have been so successful at dealing with cancer, more and more and more people come to Eden Valley with cancer in the hope of finding healing. Now, every time I see them coming, my heart goes out to these wonderful people. How I wish that I had the power to work a miracle so that every one of them would go home healed. What a blessing that would be to me. Wouldn't it be something? As soon as they walked through the door, I could say that in the name of Jesus, be healed, and they would be healed and go home. Well, how many people do you think would come to Eden Valley if I had the power to do that? You see, this is not how God works anymore. It wouldn't be any benefit to God. If I could heal people just by, by speaking a few words, uh, friends, I would have a list of people. I would have a line of people right from the Lifestyle Center all to the city of Loveland, not far away. And these people would come and we would be so rich it wouldn't even be funny. But this is not God's way. What would be the point of healing everyone that comes with cancer if all of these people go back to their homes only to live as they have always lived before? There is no way of glorifying God in living like a worldling, in doing things that dishonor God. And so God sends these people to the Lifestyle Center where we have an opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and where we have an opportunity to use those methods that we find from the spirit of prophecy and from the Bible by which God would bring healing to the people. And then God's name is glorified and honored. And what a blessing it is. So this is how God operates. I have you turn to Luke chapter 7. Go to Luke chapter 7. We're going to read verse 19 in Luke chapter 7. Verse 19. And John, calling upon him, two of his disciples said uh, to them, uh, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Now you know that John is in the dungeon. He is uh, going to lose his head. He doesn't know that probably already. But he is confused. He doesn't know what's going on. Who are we anyway? He's saying to himself, Am I on the right team? If you look at verse 20 now to verse 23. When the men were come unto him, uh, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto you, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in the same hour Jesus cured many of the infirmities and the plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. 
Then Jesus answering said to them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen, what things I have demonstrated, and, and of what things you have heard, how that the blind see and the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised to the, to the poor. The gospel is preached. Now watch verse 23. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now why did Jesus say that? Blessed is he that shall not be offended in me. Ah, friends, it's because John the Baptist was offended. Yeah. He's thinking to himself, what's the deal here? Is this really the Messiah? Why isn't he conquering the Romans? Why isn't he rescuing me? Why, in the very least, has he not come to visit me in the dungeons? Ah, friends, listen. John the Baptist was a human being. John the Baptist was a sinner like you and I. Oh, he had a very special beginning in, in life, and God used him in a mighty way, but he was still human. And to one degree or another, he had bought into the false expectations of the Jews. He had really expected Jesus that he would conquer the Messiah, that he would conquer the Romans when he came. He expected the, the Messiah to lead the, the Jewish race to be the head and not the tail, to rule the world, to fill their, cof their coffers, to bolster their pride. But the Messiah that the Jews got had no interest in any of this. He was not interested in, in gaining anything for himself. He was not interested in gaining anything for his followers either. This world is not our home. And it's not the home of Jesus either. He wanted us to follow him in his ministry. The one thing that Jesus wanted to gain was souls. And that should be our desire as well as his. And by the way... Who was John the Baptist anyway? Shall we turn to Matthew chapter 11? It's an amazing verse and I, I, I turn to it all the time because it has so much to say to me. I believe that if we could be as is demonstrated in the verse we're about to read, that we would be ready for heaven. We're in Matthew chapter 11 and we're looking at verse 11 in chapter 11. Jesus speaking says, Verily I say to you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now, who is the greatest man ever born of a woman? Jesus said, it is John the Baptist. Who said that? It's Jesus. Did Jesus know what he's saying? Well, what in the world did John the Baptist do in order to be accounted the greatest man that ever lived? It's amazing, but he overthrew no government. He never wrote a book in the Bible. I don't know that he ever performed a miracle. I never heard that John the Baptist was used of heaven to perform miracles. He was sent of God to prepare the way for Jesus. There's no doubt about it. That's what it says in the scriptures. And how many people received that? You know, it's questionable how successful he was. I suppose he was as successful as God wanted him to be. But humanly speaking, you look at it and you wonder, what is it that makes John the Baptist the greatest man ever born of a woman? Do you know that the answer to that question is in the second half of that Bible verse? Let's read it. But I'm telling you, you're going to have to put your thinking cap on. You're going to have to put your spiritual discernment cap on because it's not that easy to see and i'm hoping that i can share it with you so in the second half of verse 11 matthew 11 notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than john the baptist what is this saying our friends if you look at it carefully you can see that it is saying that john the baptist esteemed himself least than anyone else he was so humble he was so self-abnegating that he esteemed everyone else greater than himself. And if you could be more humble than John the Baptist, you would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let me read it to you from the Spirit of Prophecy if I can. This is from Last Day Events 296, paragraph 3. The greatest there, that is the greatest in heaven, is the least in self-esteem. 
and the least is the greatest in the gratitude and wealth of love. If you and I get to the kingdom of heaven, we will be so grateful. We will be happy to, for any position in heaven. It will be so fantastic. And we're going to esteem everyone else greater than ourselves. This is a commandment from God. You know that it says so in Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to go there. You can follow me if you like. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Watch. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem better, others better than themselves. That's a commandment from God. And friends, that's what heaven's going to be like. That's how it's going to be like. Shouldn't it be that way in this world? Ah, uh, it should, but it isn't. Can you imagine being in heaven and you're walking down one of those proverbial streets of gold and way down there you can see a man coming and because you have such good eyesight in heaven you've determined that that's Moses now you've been there well and you haven't met Moses yet and you begin to feel a little nervous because after all this is Moses and you look up to him but the closer and closer you come to Moses the more you recognize that he's having the same feelings and he's looking up to you and you ask him, well, why in the world? This doesn't make any sense. You're Moses, the greatest human leader this world has ever seen. How is it that you're looking up to me? And Moses would say, well, listen, it's one thing to be living way back then. Ah, but to go through the last days and to go through what you've been through and to find your way into the kingdom of heaven, you have all the admiration from me that I can muster. Friends, that's how it's going to be in heaven. Everyone's going to look up to everyone else Ah, praise God. It's not that way in this world, uh, but at least it's that way in this church, isn't it? Oh, I hope so. I hope so. That's how it ought to be anyway. And I say, friends, if we could have that experience, we would be ready to be translated. We would be ready for the kingdom of heaven. Now, we're supposed to be like Jesus. And we're not like Jesus unless we serve as he served. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 10, we're going to read verse 38 in Acts chapter 10. This is Acts 10 verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Yes. And there's a commentary on that from the pen of inspiration that says, from his earliest years, he was possessed. He was possessed with a purpose, with one purpose. He lived to bless others. I would like to be possessed, wouldn't you? Ah, oh, with this spirit, I would like to be possessed. In Acts of the Apostles 5.51, it says, the completeness of the Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. That's what I want. I want an impulse in my heart that springs constantly from within. I want to be a blessing to everyone with whom I have anything to do. Anything, that's what I want. Now, it's easy enough to look at Jesus and see that it was so in his life. He was meek and he was mild and he was gracious and he was good. And he went about ministering to every need that he saw. But when we look at ourselves, we think it's hard... Well, as a matter of fact, it's hard to believe that we could be like Jesus. After all, we are only human, aren't we? Ah, friends, I have news for you. If you are only human, you are not Christian. Because a Christian is a partaker of God's divine nature. And if you're a Christian, the works that Jesus did, you will do. Do also, and greater works than these shall you do. We dare not limit ourselves with words that say, I can't do it because I am only human. Ah, friends, no, no. We're not dependent on ourselves to do any works. We're dependent on what God can do for us. When Jesus came to this world, he came to live as we have to live with the very same equipment. And he said, I can of myself do nothing. Now, for sure, to a lot of people, that doesn't make any sense at all. But it makes sense to me because it is Jesus that said, without me, you can do nothing. And friends, if I can do nothing without God's help, then it's the same thing for Jesus. He came here to live as I have to live. He came here to live by faith. 
And so he said, I can of myself do nothing. And yet, did he do great works? Did he perform mighty miracles? Yes, but remember, he said, the Father that dwells in me, he doeth the works. And, fa and friends, God is willing to work through you also. God is willing to work through me also. And we must not limit God by a faith that is stunted because there is a God in heaven who is willing to work for us. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. We're looking at Luke chapter 10. We're going to read verses um, 31 and 30. Well, we'll start with verse 30 in Luke chapter 10. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now you recognize that we're going to um, read a few verses in the story of the Good Samaritan here. The next verse, the first three words in verse 31 says, And by chance. Now, that's an interesting word. Does anything actually happen by chance? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I can read that to you. In Desire of Ages, page 500, God in His providence has brought the priest and the Levite along the road where the wounded sufferer lay that he might see his need of mercy and of help. Was it by chance? No, God allowed these, these two men, the Levite and the Pharisee. What was it? the Levite and uh, whatever it was, they came there. So here it is, verse 31, by chance. It was not by chance. <laughs> God led these two men to see what was happening here. By chance, there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, the Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Hmm. By chance? Oh, no. God had organized it so that these men could see someone who had a need of help, the help that they could offer and the mercy that they could give him. In the book, Christ Object Lessons, 388, paragraph 0. Watch. Never. It's not very often, is it? Never should we pass by one suffering soul without seeking to impart to him the comfort wherewith we are comforted of God. Never. When you see someone has a need, you are obligated by the love of God in your soul. You are obligated to do whatever you can do to bring healing, to bring help, to bring something to that soul. And some of us are going to say, well, I don't, you know, what do I know? I've got no education. I don't know what to do in all circumstances. We all don't know what to do in every circumstance. Ah, but friends, we know how to smile. We know how to speak a word of comfort. We know how to give a lifting hand. And then sometimes the Lord will help us to do more than we think we can do. If we will only place ourselves in the situation. If we only had faith that God is willing to use us. Is God willing to use us? Ah, oh, friends, the Lord is willing to use us. And we need to put ourselves, you know, we don't need to go looking for trouble. But God will, is going to organize circumstances in our lives that we will be in connection with people who have need of help. And he says, never should we allow a suffering soul go forward or go wherever without our help, without our doing something. I'll turn now to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, wonderful chapter. Ought to be read, I think, every day. Isaiah 58. Uh, before I read anything in Isaiah 58, I do want to read a couple of quotations this is Christian service 161. He has a plan for us individually. God has. To all who serve Him, He has appointed a work. He bids us to interest ourselves in every case of suffering or need that shall come to our knowledge. How many cases? Every case. If a case of suffering comes to your mind, if God, by His by His providence, allows you to know that someone is suffering, then God is telling you, I want you to participate in helping that individual. This is what it's saying. Desire of Ages 87. Jesus worked 
to relieve every case of suffering that he saw. Every single one, he attempted to do something to bring relief to that individual. Now we're in Isaiah 58, and I don't know if you know, but I, Ellen White spoke or wrote about Isaiah 58 more than on any other chapter in the Scriptures. Did you ever wonder why? Why was that so important to her? Well, this is what we want to try to um, investigate here this, af this, this afternoon. Isaiah 58, we're going to look at verse 1. The first two words in Isaiah 58. Cry aloud. Now, what do you think would happen if we would take those two words and switch them, re invert them? It would say, loud cry. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we've studied the loud cry for a long, long time, all our lives. And when we talk about the loud cry, usually we're talking about Revelation chapter 18, verses 1, all the way to verse 5. And we see an angel coming down, having great power, to enlighten the whole world with the glory of God's character. And he has a final warning for the rest of the world. Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen. Come out of her, my people. This is what we usually think of, of course. But do you know that Isaiah 58 is addressed squarely at Seventh-day Adventists? And do you know that we have a hope in our hearts that we can be instrumental in God's hand in bringing the loud cry, the last warning to this world. Well, friends, doesn't it make sense that if you and I are going to be instrumental in, in, in giving the loud cry to the world, that we're going to have first to receive the loud cry to our own hearts? And I am here to suggest today that Isaiah 58 is God's loud cry to His children in preparation, in preparing them so that they can enlighten the whole world with the glory of God's character. Take note of that word light because we're going to see it more and more and more. You and I need to study this chapter in preparation to be used by God to give the last warning to this world. Okay, we're in Isaiah 58. We're going to begin with verse 2. And this is talking about God's people. It's a description of God's people. And it is not a flattering description, even though it looks like it in verse 2. Yet, and is God speaking now, and He's speaking to God's people. Yet they seek me daily. Isn't that good? That's what it says. They seek me daily. I wish that every one of us, every Christian in the world, every Seventh-day Adventist would be seeking God daily. Because it says in the Scriptures that, that whoever seeks Him with all his heart will be found. He will be found of them. They seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of ju justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wow, what a wonderful people. What a beautiful people. But the people are confused. You'll see that in the next verse. Here they are. They're spending time in their devotions. They're fasting. They're spending time with God. They want to know His ways and all the rest so that they can do it. Now we know we're talking about the Jewish people and we know that they were very legalistic in their approach to religion. And so this was all self-motivated. Verse 3. They ask a question, wherefore, that is, why have we fasted, that say they, and thou seest not? Why have we afflicted our soul, and you take no knowledge? Something's wrong with this picture, is what they're saying. We are so religious, and we want to know your ways so that we can do it, albeit in our own strength. How is it that when we fast and pray, you don't answer our questions? And then God answers, we're still in verse 3, Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. In the day of your fast, it's against somebody else to your advantage. This is what the problem is. If you look at verse 5, he asks, God asks the question, Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush? and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. Will thou call this a fast? 
and an acceptable day of the Lord. You know, when we think of fasting, we think of doing without food, denying ourselves food for a meal or for two meals or three or a day or, or so many days. That's what we think in terms of fasting. But if you read Isaiah 58, you're going to see that God has a different idea of what fasting is all about. He's saying it's denial, all right. You don't have to deny yourself food to be fasting. You need to deny yourself. Deny your, your time. Deny yourself the time that you want. You need to go out of your way to sacrifice to help somebody else. That's the kind of fast that God believes in. This is the kind of fast that we're talking about here in Isaiah 58. We're going to see that looking from verse 6 and on. God again speaking is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that you bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that you cover him, and that you hide not thyself from thine own flesh? This is the fast that I have chosen. Deny yourself all the pleasures and the comforts and the time and the energy, and go and help somebody. This is what God is asking. And notice the next word. The next word is then, at that point, when you've come to the place when you are like Jesus, serving as Jesus served. At that point, watch. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health spring forth speedily. Then shall thy righteousness go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. At that point, when God's people have adopted this program, then shall the, er the earth be enlightened with the glory of God's character. We read on in verse 9. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord will answer your prayers. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am, if you take away from the midst of thee the yoke and the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. And if you draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness shall be as the noonday. Can you see how many times we're talking about light here? I see a direct connection with Revelation chapter 18 when the whole world is lightened with the glory of God's character. This is the preparation in order to be used of heaven to do that work. If I skip over two chapters to chapter 60 of Isaiah, by the way, chapter 60 of Isaiah is a parallel passage of Revelation chapter 18. And the first two words are, Arise, and shine for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee when did the light come ah friends listen we've got the word of God we've got the spirit of prophecy we've got Isaiah 58 we've got the information that we need God is telling us that if we would be converted if we could become like Jesus, if we had the love of Jesus and the faith of Jesus, and if we had the desire in our hearts to serve as He served, we would go out and meet every need that comes our way. God is going to arrange the appointments. He's telling us never to let an individual who's suffering go by you and you not deal with it. And as we grow in service, dealing more and more and more with the needs of others around us, then shall our light Arise, and then shall we arise. Arise and shine, for thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is come upon thee. And it goes on to say, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen in thee, because Jesus will be in us. And we will have the character of Jesus in us. Then the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. All kinds of promises are made to us that our children shall return to us and all the rest. Verse 5, Then shall they see and flow together and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee and the forces of the Gentiles shall come to, to thee. What a glorious time. What an amazing thing is yet coming to this world. I can see it. It's going to come. There must be a people in this world that is preparing to do this in the name of Jesus Christ. There's a people who are preparing their hearts by receiving His love and going out and sharing that love with people. There are people receiving the loud cry aimed at God's people so that they can give the loud cry aimed at the world. 
In Welfare Ministries, page 32, it says this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's a Bible verse. Comment. As a people, we must take hold of this work. Love revealed for suffering humanity gives significance and power to the truth. Did you hear what I just said? Love revealed for suffering humanity gives significance and power to the truth. Friends, not very long ago, as a matter of fact, it was about a year ago, I did an evangelistic series. And do you know that one, not one person was baptized? We made up these beautiful flyers. We sent thousands of flyers out into the community. Some people came, but none of them, none of them made a commitment to be baptized for Jesus Christ. So here's the question. Do you think that a little bit of significance and power injected into that situation would have made a difference? I think so. I think so. Oh, somebody might say, but wait, wait. When we're doing an evangelistic series, it's for the purpose of helping people to see our distinctive doctrines. They need to learn about the Sabbath. They need to learn about the sanctuary and the state of the dead and salvation and all these things. Ah, friends, it's all true. But watch, watch. Another quotation, manuscript release 5, page 33. Watch. We cannot keep the Sabbath holy unless we serve the Lord in the manner brought to view in the Scriptures. Well, what Scriptures are we talking about? Let me read it again. We cannot keep the Sabbath holy unless we serve the Lord in the manner brought to view in the Scriptures. What Scriptures? Then she quotes Isaiah 58. Deal thy bread to the hungry. Bring the outcast to thy house. Clothe the naked. Visit the sick and the imprisoned. Take care of the widows and the fatherless. Loose the bands of wickedness. Relieve the heavy burden. Set free the oppressed. Break every yoke. Mow the lawn if you have to. Paint their fences. Do something to help people where they have a need. Can you see it? Ah, oh, friends. I would hope that everyone within my voice can see what I'm trying to say here. The truth on the Sabbath, the truth about tithing, the truth about the 2300 days, the spirit of prophecy or hell, any other truth that we would like to preach in an evangelistic series, all lose their significance and power if we don't love our neighbors enough to go out there and help them when they have a need. Personal, practical, hands-on help. This is the highest form of Christian standards that can be reached. This is what Jesus is hoping that, we can, that he can have in his people. Then God can use us to call his people out of Babylon. Are you willing? You know, friends, I sincerely believe that God would have far more missionaries. Oh, I'm not saying that these missionaries would travel to foreign lands. We can be a missionary right where we are. Ah, but I sincerely believe that God's people would interest themselves in the work of God more and more and more, and we would interest ourselves less and less and less in secular, secular jobs. Not that there's anything wrong with secular jobs. Hey, there's got to be God, God's people everywhere. But every single individual should be imbued with this, should be possessed with the Spirit of Jesus Christ to be a blessing to every single soul that we meet so that our desire is to see everyone saved in the kingdom of heaven and especially those who are suffering and we can see their suffering because there is nothing that reveals that we are Christian than that we are willing to deny ourselves to be a blessing to those people who have need of our help. Ah, friends, there's not that many people in the world who are willing to go that far to be a Christian. Just a little story in ending. My wife and I spent 10 years in Africa. I brought my son to Africa when he was 14. He's my baby. He's 40 years old and he's still in Africa. He's still a missionary in Africa. I have two daughters. One is a missionary in the Yukon Territories, north of Canada, and I have a daughter in Washington State, and she's in charge of all these choirs that she does for her church. My whole family is involved in serving in the church. We came home, my wife and I, and after we had been home for some time, we began receiving emails 
saying that there were 28,000 orphans in the Makete district of Tanzania. And we thought to ourselves, that can't be possible. That can't be right. How can there be 28,000 uh, orphans and nobody is doing anything? And so my wife and I decided that we would go over there to investigate. We made a trip to Tanzania. We got over there and we began to search. We would go from village to village and we would go to the local uh, public schools in these villages. And it was true. 35 to 50 percent of the students in these schools were indeed orphans. They were orphans. It began to work on my wife's um, heart. She couldn't, she couldn't leave the thing like that. There was no one else doing anything there. And so we decided 10 years ago, seeing that I am the president of Eden Valley Institute, that she would go and live in Africa in order to take care of some of these people to do all that she can. Do you know she went over there with nothing? Nothing in her pocket. She went over there and rented the first house she rented for $20 a month. That was the rent. That was the biggest house in town, by the way, $20 a month. She rented it and she lived there. It was the coldest, most miserable house I've ever been in my life. There was no ceiling. It was all cement blocks. And it was, it's cold there because it's at 7,000 500 feet elevation and it's you know it's very wet and humid and all the rest and it was oh it, it was miserable she stayed there by the way it's been 10 years she's not still in that house though i can tell you more in a minute now but she went over there with nothing and what was she to do all that she could do is mix with the people go around the villages from hut to hut from house to house to see if any one of these people had any kind of need and she would help to meet their needs if the students needed uh, school uniforms, she saw to it that they had school uniforms. If these people needed food, she helped them to find food. If they needed a ride somewhere, she would give them a ride. By the way, she has the only hearse in town. It's just a pickup, but everyone comes to her when someone dies. They need to go somewhere. She has the ambulance. It's still only a pickup, but it's the ambulance in town. Yeah. And she began to take pictures of those people she was helping, epileptics who would fall in the fire and get burnt. She would nurture, she would do the wound care, she would do everything she could do in order to meet their needs. She began to take pictures and she, she would come home to America and she would go from church to church and show these pictures and people began to throw money at her from every direction. Do you know that 10 years later, Ten years later, she has, by the help of God and, and local people and a lot of people who have volunteered to help her from the United States and other places, she has built up a whole school. She has all these buildings, like 15 new buildings, not small buildings either. She has cafeteria, she has dormitories, she has schools, and she has houses, and she's built a church, and she has 50 students at a time. They're learning all kinds of things sewing and advanced sewing, carpentry and advanced carpentry and, carp and gardening and all kinds of things. She's teaching these people because she could not stand to go into the little village where there was just a little store and see all these young people. Do you know that over there, if a young person fails grade 7, he is through with school forever. He does not get a second chance. Every young people goes to school to grade 7, and if they fail grade 7, they cannot go back to school. Well, friends, it touched my wife's heart. It really did. And she began to think, these young people, they hang around smoking and drinking, and there's AIDS everywhere, because that's why there's so many orphans, and they're all getting into trouble, and they're dying young. What can she do for them? And so she conceived the idea of having a school and now she is able to minister not only to all the orphans around. By the way, there was 800 of them in seven villages that she was, she was overseeing. And today, 10 years later, there's only 500 and some because of uh, prolonged life medicine. And people are not dying as quickly. And the young orphans are now older orphans. They're 10 years older. And there are fewer, fewer people dying. And my wife is still there ministering. Friends... This is what God wants. He wants a people who will see a need and he will go. She didn't have any special 
how should I say, it's not because she went to school, she has a grade 10 education. Oh, she's a very practical individual. She knows how to work, and when she sees a problem, she knows how to approach the problem. The Lord has given her that gift. But friends, she's only one lone woman, four foot 11, by the way. And she's out there, she went with nothing, and God has blessed her in raising a whole institution by herself, single-handedly, by the help of God and the people that God would send. Could you do something like that? Yes, you could. Friends, read Isaiah 58. It says there, cry aloud. <laughs> it's the loud cry to God's people. In preparation to give the loud cry of warning to the world. This is the preparation. And may every one of you be willing to see and jump in both feet and begin to serve as God would have you to serve. What do you say? Can you do it? Yeah. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me. We're going to ask God to organize this for us. In each one of our lives, ask God to show you what it is that He wants you to do. And it's easy, friends. It's easy. All He's going to have to show you is someone that has a need. And He's going to say, start here. Start here. You don't have to have big bucks. You don't have to have anything but a smile to begin. And God will use it. Shall we bow? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for helping us to see what it is that you want for thy people. Ah, for, Lord, it seems like we have so far to go and it seems like we're so small and it seems like we're so unprepared but we don't need the preparation so much as we need to be working with God. We need to ask you to come into our lives. We need to ask you to, to point us in the direction you would have us to go. Help us to see the individual that needs the help we can give. Give us the power. Give us the energy. Give us the time. Give us whatever it takes that we might deal with these people in the way that you would do it that we might bring a blessing to these people so that they can say there must be something special in that individual. Why does he go out of his way, her way, to help me? Father, help us to be Christians like Jesus was in the fullest sense of the word so that Jesus can come when it's his time for him to come. He will find the people at work blessing others. And we thank you for hearing our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.